Hello and welcome to today's DNS session. We are going to have a discussion on the explained articles of the Indian Express and today's The Hindu. The articles that we are going to discuss today are there on your screen and we shall discuss them as per the demand of the exam. We will begin with this explained article, Foreign Universities in India. Earlier bid stalled, why this one most ambitious? University Grant Commission has put in public domain a draft regulation allowing foreign universities to set up campuses in India. And this offers a path of globalization to the Indian higher education landscape. As the title of the article says, earlier bids stalled. Previously, there have been many attempts of internationalizing higher education in India. For instance, government brought a bill in 1995, but it was not passed. In 2005-06, again, a draft law was formed but it could go only to the cabinet stage. It was not even put in the parliament. In 2010, the government formulated Foreign Educational Institutions Bill. It was introduced in the parliament, but it failed to muster the number. But this time, the regulation that the University Grant Commission has brought has ambitious provisions. And that's why it says, why this one is most ambitious. To understand that, let me quickly give you the pointers from the draft regulation. First of all, there is a promise of complete autonomy to foreign universities for operating in the Indian branch. In terms of all the academic matters, the internal governance, the admission policy, they have all the right to decide their tuition fee and matters related to faculty hiring, their remuneration, etc. This is very significant. So far, the attempts that government had earlier this complete autonomy was not there. What is even more significant is repatriation of funds to the parent institution abroad. And this was prohibited in the earlier bill of 2010 that we have just talked about. But now complete repatriation of fund to the parent organization in the home nation is allowed. Also, there is no requirement for foreign education providers to maintain a corpus fund to be able to operate in India. The bill of 2010, it insisted on an undertaking from universities to maintain a corpus fund of at least 50 crore. The regulation also says that universities that are placed in top 500, either in the overall or subject-wise category in, in the international rankings, they would be allowed to open foreign branches in India. But also universities that do not participate in such ranking but they are reputed. Those universities are also welcomed. However, there's a clause in the regulation that says that the University Grant Commission will have the right to inspect the campus at any time. And the branches of foreign universities in India will not be outside the purview of anti-ragging and other criminal laws. Also, the UGC shall impose a penalty or suspend the approval any time if the university's activities or academic programs are against the interest of India. This regulation that the UGC has come up with, this is a major leap forward in the internationalization of Indian higher education. The ground for internationalization of Indian higher education was set up by National Education Policy of 2020. A section of the policy reads like this, selected universities those from among the top 100 universities in the world will be facilitated to operate in India. A legislative framework facilitating such entry will be put in place and such universities shall be given special dispensation regarding regulatory governance, the content norm on par with other autonomous institutions of India. There are two things here. First of all, since we are talking about the draft regulation of UGC, so government of India has taken the regulatory route, not the legislative framework as it was talked about in the national education policy. And number two, the concession that seems to have been given for the branches of foreign universities in India seems to appear more than what has been given to autonomous institutions of India. The national education policy 2020 seeks to promote internationalization of higher education in India in many different ways. The policy envisages Indian universities as large multidisciplinary centers of education that will impart high quality holistic education through cutting edge courses and internationally relevant curricula. 
That means that the National Education Policy 2020 wants to make India an education hub. It aims to provide greater mobility to Indian students by means of transfer of credits or to make it easy for them to carry out research at institutions abroad. It envisages to encourage Indian universities to set up campuses abroad, do the research collaborations, and encourage the universities to have student exchanges. It declared that the credits acquired in a foreign university will count towards an Indian degree. And in these many steps, one of the target was to allow foreign universities to enter and operate in India. All these measures were towards internationalization of Indian higher education. If you get a question on internationalization of Indian higher education, you'll have to talk about all these things. But we will restrict today's discussion on the very last bullet concerning the branches of foreign universities operating in India. But when you talk about internationalization of higher education, this is not all it. Internationalization can also happen by online courses of foreign universities. For that, FUs need not open centers here. And following the national education policy guidelines, various other measures also have been taken in this regard. Guidelines on internationalization of higher education were notified by UGC in July 2021. And that included provisions like setting up of Office for International Affairs and Alumni Connect Cell in the campus of universities hosting foreign students. In the gift city of Gujarat, world-class foreign universities and institutions would be allowed to offer courses in financial management, financial technologies, science, engineering, mathematics, and they will be free from domestic regulations. Previously, this was specific to gift city of Gujarat. UGC also has allowed institutions of eminence to set up offshore campuses. UGC came up with a regulation called as University Grants Commission, academic collaboration between Indian and foreign higher educational institutions to offer twinning, joint degree and dual degree programs. Regulations 2022. The purpose of the regulation is to foster academic collaborations between Indian and foreign higher educational institutions. So these measures have been already taken. Although obviously it will take time to fructify, but from the regulatory and policy perspective, government has taken the first leap forward. And all these measures are in the context of internationalization of Indian higher education. But in the scope of our discussion, we will be restricting ourselves today to discuss opening of branches of foreign universities. But you understand internationalization is not just that, internationalization will also include Indian universities opening branches in foreign countries, even collaborations, twinning programs, student exchanges, even the online courses, they all are part of internationalization of Indian higher education. So coming to the specific topic of foreign universities operating in India, what is the rationale? Economics is one of the most important rationale in most of the issues. It is estimated that last year in 2021, 8 lakh Indian students went abroad for higher education and they spend around 45,000 crore yearly on their tuition fee alone. Out of this 8 lakh, 2 lakh alone went to US. There has been 19% increase in the student going to the foreign countries for higher education from the previous year. And it is estimated that by 2024, 1.8 million students will go abroad and they will spend around 6.4 trillion in tuition fee and living expenses. And that is equivalent to 2.7% of India's GDP. That is also roughly 50% of India's total FDI. And that's nearly five times India's higher education budget. So we are talking of huge sum of money. Not only that, with not many foreign students studying in India, there is also a huge opportunity cost associated with lost revenues from potential foreign students. So when foreign universities will come to India, not only Indians will join them. If they keep the quality at par, their faculty team and the research laboratories at par with the home branch, even the foreign students will come to these branches because of lower fee. Therefore, if foreign universities are allowed to operate in India, it will vastly reduce the foreign exchange outflows, 
while potentially increasing the inflows. There is also an argument of cultural rub off. As you can pick from the term, when two different kind of universities, Indian and foreign, will be working in the same ecosystem, there will be a cultural rub off. And the foreign universities should push our universities towards culture of openness, competitiveness, being research oriented and innovative. It is expected that there must be healthy intellectual discourse where dissenting voices are not muffled. There would be more academic autonomy, more faculty dedication and pride in their jobs. So a healthy culture in the higher education ecosystem in India is expected by the advent of foreign universities in India. And with that culture, it is expected that the research ecosystem will also drastically improve. For instance, the scientists from CSIR or ICAR, they already have opportunities to collaborate with foreign universities, foreign institutions, but with geographical proximity, more personal networks can be built. And there will be more cohesive collaboration with Indian universities and foreign universities. Having foreign universities in India will also reinforce the new education policy's vision of making India a Vishwa Guru, where foreign students will come to study. The new education policy of 2020 envisages India to become a Vishwa Guru by making India a global educational hub. Right now, except for a very few well-known campuses, hardly any foreign students come to India. And even when they do, the applications are primarily from specific countries, mostly African countries or SARC countries. The Indian universities, they lack the essential cosmopolitan character. If foreign universities can help create a safe, enabling campus environment, provide access to quality faculties, and award globally recognized degrees, and if they can do this with around 50% of the cost as in US or other European nation, then India in medium to long run can become a hub of global education. Not only Indian students will benefit, the foreign students will start flowing into India and hence the foreign university branches can act as a catalyst in making India a global education hub. But there are many concerns here. First and foremost, the reason why it hasn't been done so far is the concern of commercialization and privatization. Private universities' fee are generally higher across courses and this fee difference with public university is even high for professional courses. And besides, even if private universities are not for profit in theory, they often actually charge capitation fees and sell the management quota seats for money. We all know this. But the point here is, the higher education in India is already commercialized. So it's not that the foreign universities are going to commercialize the higher education in India. It already is. So even if it's a concern, it doesn't hold. Because that's the nature of higher education in India presently, whether or not foreign universities participate in higher education in India. But there are other concerns of faculty poaching. Quality foreign universities with adequate financial and academic autonomy will surely be able to attract quality talent. And in short run, this may lead to poaching of the best faculty members from Indian universities. But in the long run, the NRI faculty members already gone out because of brain drain, they may be desirous of returning to India. Therefore, the faculty poaching could be blessing in disguise. Then there's a question how fair it is to Indian universities and how are we going to provide a level playing field to Indian public and private universities to be able to compete with the branches of foreign universities. There's also a concern that most reputed foreign universities, they may not open any branch in India for the risk of losing the reputation because of overextension of the brand. After the announcement of the regulation of UGC, we haven't heard from any reputed foreign university their willingness to open a branch in India. Most of them are adopting wait and watch policy. No one is overtly enthusiastic to give a statement about their willingness to come to India. Because they also face the risk of making large upfront investment, that too in a foreign country where they have to cope with differences in culture and language, new laws and regulations, new mode of doing business and so on. And finding a good pack of faculty domestically will also be a challenge. 
because the foreign universities operating in India may find it difficult to attract established scholars based in US or Europe even if they start paying them higher salaries. And we have our experience on this in case of Nalanda University. Too many talented scholars are not enthusiastic to join the Nalanda University or the South Asian University in New Delhi. Nalanda University in Bihar is a big brand but still it has dearth of talented scholars and researchers and professors. So the best bet for any branch of foreign university would be to hire quality local faculty as well as to attract the recent PhD graduates, the younger faculty members and some of the scholars of Indian origin from abroad. But then to develop an experienced pack of faculty, it would take time. And during that period, they must incentivize their home country faculty and staff members. There would also be labor issues springing up at the latter stage. Indian professors, Indian staff members hired locally, they must be paid the same salary as their counterparts in the native land. Internationally, it also has been observed that the branches of foreign universities have mushroomed or groomed in countries where financial incentive has been provided locally. In many foreign countries like China, Qatar, UAE, Singapore, the international branch campus of the foreign universities have benefited from the investment by the host country, either by a local university or by the city itself. They become the IBC sponsor. For example, the New York University, they opened a center in Abu Dhabi and that center is funded by the UAE government. The New York University also opened up a center in 2012 in Shanghai. And that happened with the collaboration of East China Normal University. And the city of Shanghai funded the opening up of IBC, the International Branch Center of New York University in Shanghai. Similarly, the Yale University opened up a branch in Singapore and the National University of Singapore collaborated with the Yale University. It also funded it. But in the draft regulation of UGC, as I have taken you through this, there is no mention of financial incentive. And hence, there's a big concern as to how much upfront investment these foreign universities are willing to do in India without any financial incentive coming from the city or by the Indian universities. Then there's a big question of mechanism for quality regulation. The course material, the evaluation criteria, the faculty standards, the infrastructure, their accreditation, their standards of education, every aspect needs to be checked and compared with the benchmarks set in our own country. But we have promised complete autonomy. Remember, complete autonomy in the academic matter, internal governance, admission policy, tuition fee, faculty hiring, remuneration. They have a promise of complete autonomy. And that brings us to the question of regulatory mechanism. We are effectively shedding our role of regulation. It, effectively, there cannot be external mechanism from the side of Indian government. They have to be self-regulated that just by coming up with a regulation for easing up the opening of branches of foreign universities in certain sense will not suffice. If foreign universities have to open up branches, there already have to be a proper ecosystem in higher education existing before they can arrive. There is a suggestion of doing liberalization before globalization as we did it in economy and so we have to do in higher education as well. India has reputed universities like IIMs, IITs. The government has taken the right decision in starting few more. However, more important is that the government should allow the new private universities and give them the same autonomy and freedom as the foreign universities are seeking. We need to allow these universities to grow and be able to compete internationally. And we have seen that given the right environment, Indian universities can compete globally. One prime example is the Indian School of Business at Hyderabad. Within a span of less than a decade, the school became the top 20 school globally as per the Financial Times report. And when we start giving more autonomy to the private institutions, then the collaborations and the tuning programs and the student exchanges and the faculty exchanges and, and sharing of research facilities with foreign universities will increase. And that ecosystem will attract the foreign universities more. It is also suggested that there must be a single national law guiding the entry and operation of foreign universities. Now, since the government of India has adopted a regulatory pathway, 
not the legislative pathway, it is suggested that an act of parliament be passed on this. Because although education falls under the concurrent list, it will be too risky for the foreign universities if state governments start having separate laws within their respective jurisdiction. There should be a single national law guiding the entry and operation of foreign universities in India. And this law shall supersede any conflicting law passed by the state. Because later on, conflicts are bound to arise. That is why it was envisaged in the national education policy that a legislative pathway will be adopted for this. And it is important to bring into harmony the conflicting laws that the state government may come up with later on. Although it is said in the regulation by the UGC that they will have complete autonomy with regard to their academic matter. But still certain incentive must be given for programs that require huge investments, the programs that are strategic. For example, programs in biotechnology, medical science, core sciences and engineering, we require them more. Also programs in which India is less competent, like transportation engineering, we should be looking for universities already doing good in such programs and they should be incentivized more to open up branches in India having those programs. A commission made of economists, sociologists, educationists must be set up to do a study on how foreign universities impacted countries like Singapore, Qatar, UAE. The commission must study how these countries made sure that only quality universities are allowed. The commission must also look into the economic impact in terms of net remittance flow. You see, when students go abroad to study, they also take up some part-time job. After the study is complete, they're also placed there. And once they are placed there, they send money freely back. And that contributes to the remittance that India gets. So these economic factors of remittance and also employability by the foreign university branches degree, these things must be studied. So we need a commission for that. And some also suggest that India make sign and ratify the Tokyo Convention. It's a dedicated forum for cooperation in ensuring qualifications are recognized as fully and widely as possible. The Tokyo Convention lays down basic principles for recognition of higher education qualifications, including increased information and transparency. It also has mechanisms for increased transparency and information sharing so as to smoothen the cross-border mobility of students, academics, and professionals. Nations like Japan, Australia, they started pushing for such a convention, and they're also founding members of the convention. So that's a short discussion on allowing foreign universities to enter India. The longer version of the discussion would discuss other points as well, considering internationalization of Indian higher education. You have to prepare it both ways. There is an explained article, Green Bonds Out. What they are, what they mean for investors and environment. You must be aware that the finance minister in her budget speech announced that the government proposes to issue sovereign green bonds to mobilize resources for green infrastructure. This time the government has made it clear that the bond will have long tenure, perhaps more than 10 years. Because the green infrastructure projects, especially the renewable energy, they have long gestation period. So we'll begin from the basic. What are green bonds? Green bonds, as the name suggests, they are bonds. So just like a regular bond, green bonds are debt instruments. They are a kind of fixed income securities. Meaning when you purchase a bond, you have to give the principal amount and you will earn a fixed interest rate. That interest rate generally is called as coupon rate. So companies, institutions, governments, corporations, they issue bonds and they raise money. But with green bonds, the money that they have raised, they can use only for green projects. Like renewable energy, sustainable agriculture, including fishery and forestry, and any other environment-related initiative. Either that relates to reducing the carbon emission, or increasing energy efficiency, or conserving ecology biodiversity. So the idea here is that the money raised from green bond must be used for green projects and no other purpose. If more than 5% of the revenue is used for any other purpose, it is not called as green bond. But apart from the technical definition and tag of a green bond, the bond works just the same as any other bond. You buy the bond, you get fixed interest rate, and then you can also trade in the secondary market. 
So the bond remains liquid. It's not that you have to wait for the long tenure of 10 years or more to get the principal amount back. In the primary market, the purchase of the bond happens and in the primary market, you can return it only after 10 years. But in the secondary market, buy and sell goes on every moment. There's a global consensus among the private and government entities to encourage green bonds. And green bonds generally carries special tax credits or tax exemptions. Although the idea is not very old, in 2007 it all started, but green bonds now have been issued by government institutions, multilateral organizations and, and various corporate bodies. For the first time, the idea of a green bond came in the form of Climate Awareness Bond by European Investment Bank in 2007. But by the name of green bond, the bond was first issued by World Bank in 2008. In India, Yes Bank was the first institution to issue green infrastructure bond in 2015. And other institutions and banks quickly started to catch up. In 2016, Axis Bank launched India's first internationally listed certified green bond at London Stock Exchange. Then in 2017, Poland issued the first sovereign green bond. By this time, green bond market started to develop in India considerably so that the SEBI had to issue guideline for green bond. In 2021, the annual issuance of green bond in, by Indian companies reached around $6 billion. But despite this huge amount of money, it was only 0.7% of Indian bond market. And in 2022, you would know that Indian government announced the plan for sovereign green bond issuance worth of $2 billion. Green bonds bring various advantages with it. First of all, it creates a goodwill for the issuer and also for the investor. It creates an environment for green funding, development of green infrastructure, investment in climate mitigation. It also creates the ability to meet the climate change commitments. For example, India has committed that the 50% of electricity production should come from renewable sources. And that requires investment in renewable energy projects and that requires credits. So green bonds are very good mechanism for fund mobilization for climate related projects. Globally, the trends varies. The interest rate offered on green bonds sometimes are more, sometimes are less than the normal bonds. But it is suggested that green bonds must offer cheaper credit. Only then it makes sense. Only then it will be an incentive to drive climate related projects. For climate mitigation projects funding, it's, it's important that the cost of raising capital is minimized. And that can be done through the mechanism of green bonds. This special mechanism of green bonds also actually helps in development of local financial markets. For example, to bring the concept of green bond, secondary market will also have to be developed to keep the bonds liquid. RBI already has categorized renewable energy as priority sector. So the banks have to lend for the renewable energy projects on priority. Sunrise sectors like renewable energy, they get boosted by the idea of green bonds. However, there are many challenges. The challenge is that the coupon rate for green bonds are high, meaning the interest that you have to give to the investor is more than the normal bonds. The reason being there is information asymmetry. People generally are not aware of the details of the projects. Also, the credit rating of the project or of the issuer of the bond is either not there or the credit rating is low. And you understand how it works. If you have to raise money, your credit rating has to be high. Issuance of green bonds will make more sense only if the tenure is high. In general, the green bond market so far developed in India has average tenure of 5 to 10 years. But average span of green projects is 13 years. There also has been question raised that the projects raising fund in the name of green bond are actually harming the environment. So clear definition and guideline of green projects must exist first for green bonds to be truly successful. Although the green bond market penetration has not been enough and it is only at infancy, it is less than 1% of the total bond market. But slowly and steadily an ecosystem is being developed to strengthen the climate financing via instruments like green bonds. In this regard, if you have to write the initiatives taken by Government of India, you can write the initiatives at various levels. First of all, you'll have to write about the targets set by Government of India for climate-related actions because the need for green bond 
preceded by the need for climate related projects have arisen because of these targets government of india has set a national goal to reduce the emission intensity of gdp by 45% from the level of 2005 by 2030 and to achieve 50% of cumulative electric power installed capacity from non fossil fuel based energy sources by 2030 and then there are other climate targets that you would very well know of so things begins from here then government of india has established indian green building council to promote the construction of energy efficient and environmentally friendly buildings but it serves a larger purpose of giving green building codes so it also helps to identify green projects in terms of constructions government of india in august 2022 has brought energy conservation amendment bill 2022 it amends the energy conservation act of 2001 it empowers the central government to specify a carbon credit trading scheme and that increases the transparency in trading of carbon credit certificates it helps to identify the green projects and it also help to build a secondary market for green bonds government of india has established a national investment and infrastructure fund and the target is with the focus on sustainability So the money collected from the green bond obviously first that will go to consolidated fund of india and then it will be withdrawn for sustainable constructions government of india in the last budget as you would know has announced that a portion of its market borrowing will be met through green bonds and sebi has already issued guidelines for the issuance of green bonds so has the rbi you know that bond market is regulated both by sebi and rbi SEBI regulates the bond markets from banks and corporations and RBI regulates the bond issued by the government. RBI also has encouraged the banks to finance green projects through use of green bonds. But if the government really wants to go global to raise fund via green bonds, then first thing is that the government needs to improve its credit rating because raising money by bond, be it any bond, green bond, blue bond, climate action bond, oil bond, any bond the investor looks at the credit rating if you are raising fund globally your credit rating has to be strong unless this is a strong the idea of green bond in global market is not going to work then there has to be clear and consistent definition and standards for green bonds as we have seen earlier the coupon rate the interest that the investors charge that is higher so it defeats the whole purpose the idea was to raise money through green bonds so as to incentivize the climate related projects and to give credit to such projects at cheaper rate but if the interest rate is high it defeats the whole purpose the interest rate is high because there is no clarity investors do not know how the money is going to spend there is no clear cut consistent definition and standards for green projects and hence the green bonds it has to be ensured that the green projects are completed on time there must be stringent monitoring of these projects the information disclosure of the project has to be very very transparent at every stage and as we have been talking about government has to develop the secondary market for the green bond you understand in primary market anything is issued for the first time you know certain bonds they have high tenure so if i purchase the bond from government of india having tenure of 10 years ideally i must wait for 10 years to get my principal back after every interval i will be getting interest but the principal will be given to me after 10 years but actually it doesn't work that way i don't have to wait for 10 years if i want to sell the bond i can sell it any moment i want i have to go to the secondary market there will be another buyer so i'll sell it to the buyer and then the buyer will either wait for 10 years or so or he or she will sell it to another person so the bond before the completion of its tenure of 10 years will be sold and bought multiple multiple times it kind of helps it keeps the security instrument liquid so the buyer of the instrument whenever he or she needs money he can sell it so that way the instrument becomes popular shares are liquid you can sell it any time bonds are also liquid so in case of green bond as well secondary market has to be developed otherwise the primary instrument will not become popular government needs to offer more tax incentives or, or other financial benefits to the investors in case of green bonds there must be a system of certification and labeling of green bonds there must be a system of sharing more information scrutiny and audit mechanism for green projects only then the coupon rate the interest rate on these bonds will decrease 
Now let's take up this article from the Hindu of today. Assam's deeper beel soars above garbage mounds. Survey shows more birds in wetlands. Let's have a discussion on the deeper beel and its wetland ecosystem. On August 25, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change has notified eco-sensitive zone of deeper beel wildlife sanctuary. It is also alternatively spelled as deeper beel or deeper beel. So first of all, eco-sensitive zone has been declared for the wildlife sanctuary, the deeper beel wildlife sanctuary. This is how it works. The eco-sensitive zone is the region around a protected area. The notification says that an area to an extent varying from 294 meters to 16.32 kilometer has been specified as the eco-sensitive zone. Just take note of this number, 16.32 kilometer. After this notification, there will be no new commercial hotels or resorts permitted within one kilometer of the boundary of protected area or up to the extent of eco-sensitive zone, whichever is nearer. Since you understand that the boundary of eco-sensitive zone from the core protected area will vary. It can be as less as 294 meter as high as 16.32 kilometer. So the distance from the deeper beel wildlife sanctuary that will come under the regulation will also vary. But in eco-sensitive zone, temporary structures for ecotourism are permitted. There are various things to be talked about here. We'll begin our discussion talking about the deeper beel itself. Then we'll understand the importance and significance of beel in this region, the lake. Then we'll also touch upon eco-sensitive zone itself. See, beel in the Assami language means lake. It also means a wetland. In general, it means a body of water. Deeper Beel is the largest freshwater lake in Assam and it is the state's only Ramsar site. There are three Ramsar sites in northeast India, the other two being the Luktak Lake of Manipur and the Rudra Sagar Lake of Tripura. The lake really is full of life. It hosts high number of flora and fauna. It hosts many migratory birds. So it has been designated as important bird area and you would know this designation comes from the Bird Life International. If you look at the map of Deeper Beel, you'll see a lot many things. First of all, you'll observe that Rani Reserve Forest and also Garbhanga Reserve Forest are very near to the Deeper Beel. In fact, this Deeper Beel, this wetland is extension of Rani Reserve Forest and Garbhanga Reserve Forest. They together form the ecosystem in the region. Without this wetland, the forest reserve, the fauna will not survive. When there is a flood-like situation, wetland absorb water and when the summer comes, the wetland releases water and sustain life in the ecosystem. These forest reserves means nothing unless there are water bodies in and around these forest reserves. The beel sustains many plants. Those plants are eaten by the elephants, which are important fauna of the reserve forest. That's how an ecosystem works. UPSC previously has asked, which of the following is the best description of the term ecosystem? Ecosystem is community of organisms living together with the environment. So both biotic and abiotic component come in the concept of ecosystem. If you separate the forest from the water body or the water body from the forest, you are actually destroying the ecosystem. This is not just the death of one lake, one beel, one wetland. This is the death of entire ecosystem. Additionally, you can see here the rail line. It has divided the wetland into two parts. One half of the wetland is at the verge of dying. The rail line cuts right through the heart of the wetland. The wetland originally was receiving water from river Basista and river Kalmani. But these rivers are getting polluted from the industrial effluents from the city of Guwahati. So the wetland is becoming toxic. You must note that deeper beel wetland does not get water from Brahmaputra river, although it is in Brahmaputra valley. The excess water from the wetland does flow out into the Brahmaputra. But the wetland does not source its water from the Brahmaputra river. The deeper beel wetland is full of life. It houses many flora and fauna. Some of the fauna you must note for the exam. Among the birds, cylinder bile vulture are found there. Along with the list of the name of the fauna, you must also know their IUCN conservation status, which for the cylinder bile vulture is critically endangered. Greater adjutant stock are also found there. They are endangered. Lesser adjutant stock, vulnerable. Then there are other birds and it will be good if you remember their name and IUCN conservation status. For example, spot bile pelican, near threatened. 
black neck stock near threaten large whistling tail open bile stock and present tail janakars these are least concern the reserve forest around the wetland houses huge number of elephants and there is also an elephant corridor in the region the iocn status of asian elephant is endangered there are leopards which are vulnerable barking deers they are least concern chinese porcupine which belong to the family of rodent least concern sambar deer are also found there and it is vulnerable you must be aware that for your prelims examination you have to have a long list of fauna and also flora along with their iucn conservation status you just have to chip this in that list or it might already be there in your list now let's talk about something very important that will help you understand as to why conservationists are so concerned about wetlands in general and in this case the deeper beel wetland efforts are being made since 2008 to get this wetland categorized as eco sensitive zone for the deeper beel wildlife sanctuary wetland first of all is any water body no matter what the size is it could be man made natural salty brackish fresh water permanent or temporary whatever any water body of substantial expanse is considered as wetland the paddy field submerged under water is also considered as wetland Wetlands are the most productive ecosystem on earth. It supports numerous flora and fauna and it's directly or indirectly linked with food security and too much of economic benefit. Wetlands serves as natural rainwater harvesting site. It collects the precious rainwater within it. Water supply to the big cities many a times come from these wetlands. Wetlands which are in close vicinity to rivers also acts as buffer that control the flood and river flow. when the level of these rivers rises water flows into the wetland and when the river water level decreases water from these wetlands gushes into the river and maintain the average flow sustaining the life in the region mangroves which are mostly found in such ecosystem not only protects the land from speedy waves but offer protection from cyclones as well you must be aware that during 2004 tsunami it was found that the coast with good mangrove vegetation were least affected wetlands also acts as natural rainwater recharging zones water is getting stored in the wetland slowly percolates into the aquifers you see every water system has a self cleansing mechanism even lakes does that by sedimentation but wetland is much advanced in cleaning up the water many flora and fauna present in wetland are found to be effective in treating water even if the percentage of coliform is very high Many species of algae and plants have remarkable capacity of accumulating the heavy metals into their stems and leaves. This is why wetlands are also called as the kidney of the ecosystem. Wetlands you see also play great role in regulating local climate, particularly the temperature and the moisture. The phytoplankton community are very good carbon sequesters and absorb carbon dioxide much faster than terrestrial plants. so wetlands acts as very good carbon sinks they become natural habitat for numerous animals and plants wetland being the most productive cleaning up the ecosystem providing food security to people around it and also to the fauna living in the region and they controlling the local climate they are crucial piece they are crucial part of the ecosystem if wetland dies rest of the ecosystem will soon follow from the aesthetic and recreational perspective wetland is a great place it's a paradise for bird watchers so now you have understood the importance of wetland you understand that since it is important so it must be protected and one of the way of protecting it is to declare it as eco sensitive zone for the concerned protected areas around which the wetland exists so for restoration of wetland and its conservation the first thing is the eco sensitive zone that it has been declared must have effective implementation and for that what is of prime importance is to have local participation in terms of local conservation committees there have been many ngos and local committees local bodies institutions that have been working for conservation of deepor beel for long for example early bird is one of the grassroots environmental organization that have been working among the tribal community living around the wetland they are trying to create awareness among the tribal communities skill them with some alternative livelihood so that the pressure on the wetland for extraction of resources for livelihood decreases 
Similarly, Aranyak is a local society for biodiversity conservation. It has been very vocal, it has lobbied very hard for declaring the Depor Beel as eco-sensitive zone. But now since the wetland region has been declared as eco-sensitive zone, there has to be more follow-up done to ensure its effective implementation. And for that, local participation is quaint essential. We saw in the beginning that the wetland draws its water from two of the rivers which now have become the link to dump the waste into the wetland. So a special waste management plan must be put in place by the state government and executed. Just like you must have understood in yesterday's DNS how Rajasthan government is making effort to conserve the Sambar Lake. The infrastructure projects of road and rail has been cutting crisscross to the wetland. Now since it has been declared as eco-sensitive zone, so at least the train stops on the boundary of the lake must be discontinued. The train route, if possible, can be diverted from around the wetland. It's important that the state government develop a sustainable ecotourism model. It is important in every sense. First of all, developmental activities as such cannot stop. State government need revenue. So tourism industry has to work, but it has to work in a sustainable manner. Additionally, ecotourism model will develop sources of livelihood. The villages around the wetland are socio-economically backward. So unless alternative means of livelihood are given to them, the pressure of resource extraction from the wetland will remain high. See, the region around the deeper wheel have natural depression. It has been suggested that using them, and in fact even increasing the storage capacity of these depression, the runoff that comes from the rivers and the streams can be treated before discharging into the lake. There are many algae, many plants that absorb much of the pollutants, the heavy metals. They can be grown in these depression region or even the simple sedimentation process can be used to filter out the water. And those sedimentations can be periodically cleaned up. And the most fundamental thing, awareness, education regarding conservation. You know, Rachel Carson wrote a book, The Silent Spring. And that book formed the basis for the beginning of environmental movements. So writing, creating awareness, they are fundamental in any conservation activity.